Welcome to the Revelation series, part 58. We're going to look at the middle section of chapter 19. We're very close. There's only 22 chapters in this book. So we're going to look at uh, verses 10 to 16, Revelation 19. We've Where we are in the context is the seven years of tribulation are over, and believers are either raptured or killed for not worshiping the Antichrist and taking his mark, right? So the believers are raptured, then there's going to be a post-rapture um, revival where people are going to go, oh my goodness, uh, I've been lukewarm. <laughs> and so it's going to be a great multitude that no one can count of post-rapture converts. They will be killed, okay? Post-rapture converts will be killed for not worshiping the Antichrist and and taking the mark of the beast or of the Antichrist. For the last two and a half chapters, we've been looking at, no, 16, 17, 18, so three and a half chapters, there's, there's, we've been looking at this great city of corruption called Babylon. And it's responsible for the corruption and rebellion of every other city and ultimately the persecution of, of believers. Um, and uh, this city is burning for all the world to see. God is, has, has destroyed it, is in the midst of destroying it and or purifying it. Babylon is both Israel and, uh, and, and the Satan's uh, city. Israel for rejecting God for thousands and thousands of years while he's trying to woo them and then ultimately rejecting Jesus as the Messiah. As a nation, there are certainly Christian Jews, but uh, very few. So the unbelievers are weeping over this Babylon because they're not getting their luxuries from her anymore or from the city. And the believers are rejoicing because it's the end of the age. Now, the second coming of Jesus wipes out all of the unbelievers. All right, so here we go. We're going to read. Here comes Jesus. <laughs> Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. I'm excited about this teaching, although it is at the same time heart-wrenching what you have to do, even though everything that you've already gone through. Thank you for dying for our sins and making it so easy to be a, a Christian, a follower of Jesus, that you make us, by your blood, you make us holy and righteous, so much so that your spirit can now easily and simply come into us. Now, we want to take advantage of that, of your spirit in us, that it would illuminate your word, and, and you being the word of God, that the Holy Spirit would remind us of all the things that you said, and that in this section of, of your word, it would illuminate in our hearts and our spirits, even the parts that our brains aren't quite sure of or don't understand. You can do something deep unto deep, spirit unto spirit. Fill each room represented here online with your presence. In your name, Jesus. Amen. All right. Chapter 19, starting at verse 10. Okay, so it's kind of the end of this, this section, threefold hallelujah over Babylon's fall, but um, it, just so that the teaching can be more even. So here it is. There's, there's an angel. John is talking to an angel. And he says this. At this, I fell at his feet to worship him, the angel, to worship the angel. But he said to me, don't do that. I'm a fellow servant with you and with your brothers and sisters who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for it's the spirit of prophecy who bears testimony to Jesus. And then the next section in my Bible is titled, the heavenly warrior defeats the beast. Verse 11, I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse, whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He's dressed in a robe, dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, 
King of Kings and Lord of Lords. All right, so we're going to stop there. Verse 10, that's a long verse. Uh, at this I fell at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, don't do that. I'm a fellow servant with you and with your brothers and sisters who hold the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for it's the spirit of prophecy who bears testimony to Jesus. So this is the clearest answer to, to should we worship angels. No, don't do it. <laughs> the, the angels rebuke you. This angel puts... The angels and human believers in the same class, doesn't he? Those who have the testimony of Jesus. Um, the Holy Spirit. And the testimony of Jesus is that he is the Son of God and God, Emmanuel, God with us, and that he died for the sins of the world. He became sin for us, died on the cross, and rose victorious three days later, showing his power over hell, death, and the grave. So, that's the testimony of Jesus. The Holy Spirit, which is the spirit of prophecy, is the only one who bears the testimony of Jesus. We have it, but he bears it. Uh, King James Version says this, it, the, the, phrases this verse this way, I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus, worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Okay, this, so this may be a combination of two things. The Holy Spirit is the messenger of all that Jesus said. Right? He said to his disciples uh, before he went to the cross, this is in the Garden of Gethsemane, all this I've, John 14, all this I've spoken while still with you, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. All right, so Holy Spirit reminds us of what Jesus said. I, that was in my prayer this evening. And Jesus speaks the Father's word. Two chapters earlier in John, John chapter 12, for I did not speak on my own, but the Father who sent me commanded me to say all that I've spoken. So the testimony starts with the Father, goes to the Son, to the Holy Spirit, and to us. Thus the Holy Spirit earns the title, the Spirit of Prophecy. So the Holy Spirit is the conduit of the, of the power of the resurrection. Okay, Romans 8, I love this. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead, so it's the Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his Spirit who lives in you. Resurrection power from the Father to the Holy Spirit to the Son to us. Isn't that awesome? That testimony of Jesus. The Holy Spirit is both the conduit of the power and the information of the testimony. So the testimony that I gave you. Believers are the receptors and the benefactors of the testimony. We get salvation out of it. Angels are the, re the receptors, but not the benefactors. They don't, they don't get saved. If they fall from their position, then they're demons. They're, they're, they're evil spirits and they have no chance of salvation. But they are the pr protectors of us, the benefactors. An angel's primary um, function is to link humans to God, right? Which is, which is why when Jesus was here, who ultimately links us to God, that's the testimony, the angels were like ready. You just say the word, Jesus, that we're going to protect you. Um, so that's kind of cool. So a little timeline note. In Revelation 22, and when we study that, we'll, we'll actually come back to this 19th because they're both joined. In Revelation 22, verse 8, John falls down to worship at the feet of an angel again. But I don't think it's again. John would not be disobedient or forgetful enough after being rebuked by this angel. John must be reflecting on this moment in Revelation 19. So Revelation 19 and 22, both times when he falls down to worship the angel, the angel rebukes him. I believe it's the same account. And in Revelation 22, it, it says this, I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I had heard and seen them, I fell down to worship at the, at the feet of the angel who had been showing them to me. So we see here that it's this angel in Revelation 19, this guy, 
is the same angel that's been showing John most of the revelation. Isn't that neat when we rightly divide the word? Just a little, little teaching point in there. I also want to just take a look at that line, uh, for it is the spirit of prophecy who bears testimony to Jesus. The cool thing about that is the testimony of Jesus. So a prophecy is when you catch God's heart, either for a situation or for the future. So a prophetic word can be a, a, a like the revelation is a prophetic word. Well, the whole Bible is, but it's prophesying the future. Isaiah prophesied about the future, right? So prophecy can be, I don't want to say a prediction because it sounds like fortune telling, but it, it points to the future. And the testimony, so the spirit of prophecy, the testimony is a forward motion. The testimony of Jesus is a backwards motion. He did it. And so the spirit of prophecy, which is forward, bears witness to the testimony of Jesus. See what I mean? Jesus' testimony proved the prophecy. The, 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 the prophecy of Isaiah, the testimony of Jesus proved that too. So because he has, he's, he's, he's so faithful to do all these things, we know as we read the book of Revelation that the prophecy is going to be the testimony of Jesus. And so this, though we're looking at the future, this is the spirit of prophecy and the testimony of Jesus. And we can enjoy that even though it's still a future event. Does that make sense? Okay. It does to me. Verse 11, I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is faithful and true. I like that heaven standing open. So you just see John stand, he's on the earth. And somehow, remember earlier in John chapter 4, he sees a door standing in heaven. Here he says, heaven standing open. Imagine what that will look like, you know. We've seen moments of the second coming through Revelation. I've harped on this many times. The seventh seal, Revelation 8, Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and hurled it on the earth. And there came peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning. Now that trio was in Revelation 4 as well, around the throne. So that trio, very specific, right? Thunders, rumblings, flashes of, thund of lightning. It indicates the presence of God. And then here, and an earthquake. That's what happens when the presence of God comes to earth. Then the seventh trumpet. Amongst loud praising in heaven and the 24 elders falling on their faces and worshiping, Revelation 11 says, which is the seventh trumpet, then God's temple in heaven was open and within his temple was seen the ark of his covenant. Which is going to be a, like the Jews would go, no, no, we're not allowed to see that. But they, anyway. And there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and a severe hailstorm to boot, right? Those 100-pound hailstones. So this, that indicates the presence of God coming to earth. And then Revelation 16, uh, which is the, the bowl of wrath, the seventh angel poured, poured out his bowl of wrath into the air and out of the temple, came a loud voice from the throne saying, it is done. And there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, and a severe earthquake. No earthquake like it has ever occurred since mankind has been on earth. So tremendous was the quake. The great city split into three parts and the cities of the nations collapsed. God remembered Babylon the great and gave her the cup filled with the wine of the fury of his wrath. Every island fled away and mountains could not be found from the high... From the sky, huge hailstones, each weighing about 100 pounds, fell on people, and they cursed God on account of the plague of hail, because the plague was so terrible. So the seventh seal, seventh trumpet, seventh bowl of wrath, obviously, as we read the text, one after another, are talking about the same event. And as we rightly divide the word from Revelation 4, it is the presence of God coming to earth. That is the second coming of Jesus. Now in our text, I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is faithful and true. That's the second coming of Jesus. In Revelation 6, we saw that first seal open. I actually preached on this a couple weeks ago. It's called the real Jesus. 
<coughs> excuse me, and there was a rider on a white horse bent on conquest. Well, this is the first, that's not Jesus. The first test of end times was a counterfeit Jesus. Will you recognize the real Jesus amongst all the imposters? Here is the first time we see the real Jesus on a white horse. And won't it be worth it all? His name, Faithful and True. This rider isn't bent on conquest. As if it had the chance to lose the battle without being fully engaged. This rider, it's almost like effortless. He's faithful and true. And is simply accomplishing his purpose. To judge the living and the dead. Jesus refers to himself as this to the church in Laodicea. Remember in Revelation chapter 3? One of the seven letters to the seven churches. These are the words of the Amen. The faithful and true witness. The ruler of God's creation. The credentials to this title, the Amen. Jesus' agreement is necessary for anything to happen in creation. John, again, John the Revelator, in his gospel, he says, all things were created through Jesus. Witness, the word witness, Jesus has seen everything from beginning to end and will judge according to everything he's seen. And then ruler of God's creation, all things were put at his feet, confirming his position as the amen. See the tapestry of all that together. Verse 11 continues. With justice, he wages, he judges and, and wages war. This can't be understated or overstated at all. This is the fifth declaration. Even though God looks mean, He's being just. This is the valley of decision. He's just responding to the decision of the reject the rejectors. Is that a word? The people rejecting him. Since the seventh bowl was poured out, this is the fifth declaration of God being just. And the last of the 21 judgments, the seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls of wrath, seven times three. Judge. Jesus' credentials to judge are his death and resurrection. Many have died for causes. Okay, so there's the death. A few have resurrected. We see Lazarus in the New Testament, but eventually he dies later. A few have ascended without dying. Both Enoch and Elijah did that. But none have died, resurrected, and ascended into heaven, never to, to, to die again. Only Jesus. Verse 12, his eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. When Jesus initially introduces, reintroduces himself to John in chapter 1, he has those eyes of blazing fire. I can't wait to see that, I think. <laughs> Throughout the Revelation, the Son of God appears in contrast as one with eyes like, of, like blazing fire and the Lamb, right? We mentioned before, he's the lion, he's the Lamb. He's the, don't mess with me. I'm, I'm going to be just. I've, I've laid out the relationship that I want to have with people. You reject that. Then I will be the lion, the one with eyes like blazing fire. And I will respond. But I am also, at the exact same time, the lamb. I want to redeem. I want to join you know, I, I've done everything in my power to make it simple for you and me to be together now and eternally. And both of these create the, the, the balanced picture of the character of Jesus, a relentless judge and loving redeemer. Being out of balance to either of these attributes will create conflict in the life of the believer. And, uh, you know, we got to watch, you know, who's speaking in, into your life. It's got to be balanced preaching, balanced teaching. Where he's just, he's not a pushover, but he loves you and has done everything in his power to connect you to him. Many crowns. I'm going to go out on a limb here. It's the first time we see the Son of God with crowns on his head, other than the crown of thorns. But that was a mockery, wasn't it? He's the King of Kings, but will not share his kingdom. So while all, while all others wear crowns on on the earthly kingdom, so Satan's kingdom. The Son of God rules from heaven still, even now. He, he rules from heaven and on earth through his ambassadors, us. Well, we're at least, an ambassador is one who works on behalf of a king or a ruler in a foreign country. We're in a foreign country. That's why it's so tough out there. We don't fit, don't try to fit. 
and uh, we are the ambassadors. So he rules earth from heaven through us. Now that all the earthly crowns, so at our text here in Revelation 19, all the earthly crowns are removed, he now appears on earth with many crowns. <laughs> I love that. He's just gotten rid of all the earthly crowns. He now shows up with a whole bunch of crowns, many not even worth counting. They outnumber any other king before him. Verse 12, he has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. Now this is interesting because John is, he knows that he has a name, but he's saying no one knows it. So either John didn't recognize the language of the writing and knew no one else would recognize it either, or John was told about the name and the fact that no one else knew except the writer. Like somebody, the angel might have said, he's got a name on him um, and no one, no one knows what it is. So the name is written on him, perhaps a tattoo of sorts on his glorified spiritual body. The name won't be Jesus because we know that name. So this new name is very mysterious. This may be a new revelation of Jesus's position or duty in the millennial reign and in the next story. A new name. Because a name in God's economy is, is a good name is very important more to be uh, to be sought after more than great riches in fact a good name he's dressed in a robe dipped in blood so it's dipped we're washed in his blood but he's just dipped because he, Jesus had no need for redemption he was sinless therefore pure white clothing wasn't required to signify his purity and he had no need to be washed in his blood like we do as sinful humans however his, his robe is dipped in blood to remind us of his sacrifice and authority to cleanse sins by his blood isn't it interesting that at the second coming when he's coming to wipe out all of those who have rejected his blood he has a reminder on the on the tip of his robe that you could have been redeemed that's my heart and, and a little indication of the lamb there too, isn't it? Right? The lamb that was slain. The blood is at the bottom of the robe, dipped. Later, verse 15, we, we see him treading the winepress of God's fury. Perhaps this blood is the blood from the winepress, you know, which is either the power of the saints, remember in that teaching, or the judgment of unbelievers. So since the blood is the symbol of Jesus' redemption, this is an important reminder that I just said this really but to reiterate because this is a very important point that at the second coming when Jesus looks angry and cruel he he initially came to redeem not to destroy and that that dipped robe is a is a glaring reminder and his name is the word of God again John wrote his gospel after seeing and writing down this revelation. I think there's so many clues to that. So that's why there's no doubt in my mind why John, after seeing Jesus coming in, eyes, eyes of blazing fire and, and the robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God, John starts his gospel this way. In the beginning was the Word. He, he'd have this image in his mind. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. I'm not going to open with a baby in a manger. That was a tremendous, tremendous uh, way to enter. But I'm not going to start that way. The, the other guys did it. I'm going, to, I'm, going to, I'm going to enter him in the way I saw him enter in the, in, at the end of this age. Yeah. Verse 14. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. The armies of heaven. Who are they? Well, the angels were seen wearing clean linen uh, in Revelation 15. And believers collectively, the bride, were seen wearing clean linen. So everybody's wearing clean linen. These, these, this group following him, also riding white horses, are in fine linen, white and clean. Consider the reference to the bride wearing clean linen is only four verses prior to this text. It seems reasonable that this army is both angels and believers. And watch this. When I was listening to Revelation after I prepared these, these notes, 
I was remembering this, Revelation 17. Uh, those kings with the scarlet beast have one purpose and will give their power and authority to the beast. They will wage war against the lamb, but the lamb will triumph, for, triumph over them because he is the Lord of lords and king of kings. And that's the second coming, right? This is Armageddon. Jesus answers their call to war, the kings, the, um, the, the reject, the kings who have rejected him, they're, they're waging war, second coming, he comes in. This is the same context. And with him will be his called, chosen, and faithful followers. We get white horses and we're riding behind him in this text. That's us. But also, if you go, I was remembering Matthew chapter 25. The sheep and the goats. And I, I remember this. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. And what he says to, to the sheep, it's the separating of the sheep and the goats, which, which happens at this point because of what he says to the sheep. Come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. So he's setting up his kingdom in the sheep and the goats, which, which allows us, to have this moment, the second coming, the ushering in of the millennial reign, and the angels are with him. So, rightly dividing the word, we're going to be riding white horses mixed in with the angels. <sighs> Enough said. <laughs> I, got, I don't know about you, but my, my imagination is just flying right now. Um, Better than any movie. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. So this is also part of the Son of God's introduction in Revelation 1, when he's introducing himself, revealing himself to John. We noted then that out of his mouth is symbolic of the power of the tongue, which is creative abilities, Genesis 1. He spoke everything into existence and holds the power of life and death. James tells us that in his third chapter. We also noted that the sword is the symbol of his word, Hebrews 4. The word of God is sharper than any double-edged sword, which, which confirms the description of faithful and true, his words, faithful and true. And it's with this weapon that he will strike down the nations. It's the words of Jesus that will expose, judge, destroy the disobedient those who disobey his words, the unfaithful and the untrue, right? He will rule them with an iron scepter. This is another connector to, to the fact that we will be riding with him because this was the promise Jesus made to the overcomer in Revelation 2. Again, one of the letters to the seven churches. That one, the one who's victorious, will rule them with an iron scepter and will dash them to pieces like pottery just as I have received authority from my father. This was also the description of the male child that was born to the woman, Revelation 12, the woman and the dragon, which we suggested, but rightly divided the word and saw that that male child was the Gentile nations brought into redemp the redemption plan because the Jews rejected the Messiah. So here's the description here of the son of God. So this unique phrase rule with an iron scepter, seems to be deliberately used to link the second coming to the Son of God and redeem believers, which confirms who the armies of heaven are, right? Verse 15 continues, he treads the winepress of the fury of God, of the wrath of God Almighty. So in Revelation 14, we're told that anyone who worships the beast in his image and receives its mark on their forehead and on their hand will drink the wine of God's fury. In Revelation 14 also, we see that the source of the wine, the grapes, are ripe. The grapes are good. Then when they're trampled, there's a similar scene to the death of Jesus, right? Wine poured out on the, on the outside of the city, just outside the city, right? Which is where Jesus died. So perhaps the grapes, being believers, right? We are the fruit of, of God's vine, um, and the winemaker, 
who is Jesus, work together in the wine in the wine press to produce a wine of wrath that unbelievers will drink to their destruction. It's great, deep, deep symbolism here. Uh, and note that the blood was meant to save, but when rejected, it becomes the blood that condemns. Right? His robe is dipped in blood, a reminder that you could have, this could have turned out different for you. Hmm. The last verse for this evening, this teaching, on his robe and on his thigh he had this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So this is the second name we're told is written on the Son of God, after being told that he had a name written on him that no one knows. So there's three names that are written on him. Uh, this, this inscription isn't just declared that he's the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, but he's proving it. In this moment, the second coming. And we'll be with him. As tragic as this event's going to be, I'm excited. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. And blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written. Because the time is near, closer than it's ever been. Amen.